Hi, my name is Deria. I'm a PhD student in the, at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics in Gachingen, near Munich. Um, I work in the group of Professor Hensch, and, uh, and today I'm going to show you the 1S3S laboratory where we do precision spectroscopy on atomic hydrogen uh, using the fre frequency comp spe uh, spectroscopy technique, which was uh, awarded a Nobel Prize in 2005. Please be aware that this is a 360 degrees video. So by clicking in the video and moving your mouse, you can actually look upwards and downwards and also swipe to the left and right. If you look to the left, you should see the door of our workshop. And if you look to the right, you should see a, a poster of our chair retreat. So now uh, please follow me to the lab. So, uh, welcome to our laboratory. As you can probably guess from the name of the lab, we are doing spectroscopy on the 1S3S transition in atomic hydrogen. Uh, in this lab, we can actually me measure this frequency uh, with a precision of 10 to the minus 12, corresponding to just 750 hertz measurement uh, error in a transition of, uh, with a frequency of around 2 petahertz. Um, yeah, as the hydrogen atom is such a simple system, we can, uh, uh, we can actually also calculate the transition frequencies to this accuracy and thereby compare our experimental results with theoretical predictions and test the theory of quantum electrodynamics. At this level of, a, uh, of precision, we are actually even sensitive to the fact that the proton is not a point-like particle but has a finite charge radius. Um, this finite expansion of the charge causes a tiny shift of the electron levels um, which we can actually resolve in the measurement and thereby we can, by combining our measurement with other precision measurements at hydrogen, determine the radius of the proton. So uh, let's have a look at our experiment. We are exciting the 1S3S transition, which is a dipole forbidden and therefore we need two photons to drive it. So we are using two photons at 205 nanometers. After the excitation, the atom will decay via the 2P state back to the 1S state and thereby emit two fluorescence photons of which the red one we collect um, and use to generate our resonance curve while we scan over the transition frequency. This is a sketch of our setup. So what we need is a frequency comp at 205 nanometers and then we want to place <coughs> atoms in the pulse collision volume um, yeah, between the two pulses. We generate the frequency comp at 205 nanometer by frequency doubling a uh, mode locked titanium sapphire laser at 820 nanometer twice because there is no efficient laser source at 205 nanometers. So yeah, we first generate the comp at 820 nanometers. We constantly measure its absolute frequency by overlapping it with a reference laser which is continuous wave um, and the frequency of this laser is constantly measured by using a commercial frequency comp. Then we frequency double our comp twice and then couple it into the final enhancement cavity um, where the spectroscopy takes place in the pulse collision volume. This part of our setup where uh, the reference laser is generated and locked to an um, ultra stable cavity is actually not in our lab but in a neighboring lab and we are just getting this uh, reference laser via a fiber cable. Um, this mode lock laser you can see over there. Then we have these two second harmonic generation stages which are placed over there in the background. And here in the foreground you can see a vacuum chamber with the final enhancement cavity um, where the spectroscopy takes place. So now uh, please follow me to, our, to the beginning of our laser system. So this is the laser that generates our uh, mode-locked frequency comp at uh, 820 nanometers. After the generation, a small part of the laser is coupled out and here coupled into a fiber, where it is actually overlapped with a reference laser coming from the other lab laboratory. This laser is, step, is 
uh, locked to an ultra low expansion cavity and thereby uh, and co also constantly measured and thereby it gets a line width of roughly one hertz. <clears throat> and yeah, by overlapping these two lasers, we can have a look at the, uh, rel uh, at the frequency difference. And as we know, the absolute frequency of this laser, uh, we can thereby um, measure the uh, excitation frequency that we are using in absolute units. Here you can see the, spectrum, the spectral envelope of our frequency comp and also uh, the narrow line of the reference laser that we're using. This spectrum analyzer can neither resolve the actual comp modes <coughs> in our laser nor the very narrow line width of uh, the reference laser that we're using. So now uh, please follow me around the table to our second harmonic generation cavities. So here we generate, uh, we convert the comp from 820 nanometers to 205 nanometers. This is done in two subsequent uh, enhancement cavities. So first, the first one ranges from this mirror over here to this mirror. Here we have the nonlinear crystal. Then we have a, an outcoupler mirror where the doubled 410 nanometer light can leave the cavity and the 820 nanometer light is guided back over here. Um, we can stabilize the length of this cavity to a tiny fraction of the wavelength to make it resonant with our laser. We do this by using the Hench-Guyot locking scheme, uh, which generates an error signal which we feed back on the piezo on which this mirror here is mounted, and thereby we can cancel all vibrations uh, that occur in our system and make the cavity resonant to our laser. Then. After the first cavity, we couple the laser into the second cavity, um, from here to here, over here. And uh, here you can see the plastic box of, the, of a BBO crystal. Um, we use BBO because it can be phase matched for 200, 205 nanometer light. Um, but to achieve this, we need to cool it down to minus 20 degrees Celsius. And uh, yeah, therefore, to prevent the formation of ice on the crystal surfaces, we have to flush it with nitrogen all the time. And therefore, we have this plastic box around it to make sure that there is no air humidity close to the down-cooled crystal. After this, we have a frequency comb at 205 nanometers, which we then couple into the last enhancement cavity, uh, which is actually in this vacuum chamber over here. Um, so this is the first ingredient that we need for our experiment. The second one are hydrogen atoms. These we get from this hydrogen bottle, which we have here. Um, and there are our hydrogen, hydrogen molecules. Um, they flow through these tubes and this valve with which we can control the flow of hydrogen to this radio frequency cavity. And inside this glass tube, we can apply a strong RF field which rips apart the molecules and dissoci dissociates them into atoms. And these atoms are then guided into the vacuum chamber. So after, dissociate, after dissociation, the atoms enter the vacuum chamber via this copper nozzle. This nozzle is cooled to 4 Kelvin by liquid helium. Um, the atoms bounce around in the nozzle and thermalize and then leave the nozzle through two tiny holes on both sides and propagate along the beam line until they reach the pulse collision volume which is roughly over here. And usually we have a detector installed here which couples the fluorescence light into optical fibers, fibers that guide the light out of the vacuum chamber on photomultiplier tubes. But uh, today I have removed the detector so you can see the vacuum chamber better, but yeah, if you come now out of the vacuum chamber, uh, you can have a look at the detector. This is our detector. Um, as you can see, there are four ports to insert the fibers, which are these. They have, we have uh, tiny lenses on top of them to more efficiently couple the light into the fibers. And th those fibers are looking at the very center of the pulse collision volume which is inside these meshes. These meshes serve as a Faraday cage to, sh to shield 
the excitation region from stray electric fields. <clears throat> and we can also use them to deliberately apply an electric field to measure the DC stark shift of our transition. Yeah. So this is all from my side. Thank you for watching the video. In case you have further questions or are interested in joining our group for a bachelor, master or PhD project, please uh, feel free to contact us. You can find uh, the website of our group in the video description. Um, thank you for watching and have a nice day.